Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Lyudmila Kisilova, and I'm a, a phys uh, physician, um, physicist. So I have a question to um, um, Andrei. Uh, you've talked about uh, doctors of 40 years of age, and I'm 30. And there is a huge uh, problem of communication and lack of uh, the uh, willingness to establish communication. So my question is, is it possible in Russia, uh, taking into account our mentality it, uh, later, solve this problem? And uh, what is the level of this problem? Where should it be solved? At universities, or some personal characteristics of each doctor. So is it a doctor's decision whether he wants or not to establish the communication? So last year, I was trying to find um, a, some course in Russia that uh, helps to improve these skills. And I found only one school in Moscow. It seems that doctors do want for, for several, some uh, reasons, uh, to improve the situation. So another question, if the patient during the visit asks the doctor to give some sources uh, for alternative medicine, so my patients often ask me, so do you think it's uh, worth giving some sources for alternative medicine? So the second question, no. I don't give any alternative uh, sources. Uh, as a rule, patients come with their own uh, sources and, of, and uh, ideas about the treatment, and I only comment uh, about this. So it's very important um, to make sure that this alternative treatment is not aggressive, uh, that it will not deteriorate uh, the state, it will not complicate the process of standard treatment. As for the causes, first of all, uh, the definition of a problem is already good, and the Hel Ministry of Health and the authorities now realize that uh, doctors do not know how to communicate with patients. It's a skill, and this skill ca can be improved. It's not a part of prof doctor's professionalism. A professional without skills for communication, I don't think this professional is complete. So these are some basic courses for communication starting from the university, and then with the doctor's development, this are some kind of courses depending on the sphere of uh, work and um, oncological treatment is a different type of uh, treatment, so it should be separated from all other uh, types of diseases. I think that the problem is recognized now, which means that uh, we'll move forward at some point. So, and you, you understand that if we change education, then we'll have to change it as a whole. Basic education is really low, and the quality is bad. So, it seems that we are at the stage right now when we um, recognize everything and we'll make decisions, but uh, these decisions won't be fast, I'm sure. Dear colleagues, any other questions? Hello, my name is Paulina Polishuk. First of all, thank you to the presenters for this uh, different uh, opinions, uh, different presentations, especially after listening to Gabriela and uh, other colleagues. It seems that uh, we are discussing problems that are on the next level abroad, but here, uh, they only begin discussing such issues. And so the first question is to Sergei, because you've started a research that uh, will probably be the first uh, one, the research on the communication of the patient and doctor. So what do you want to, um, how do you want to evolve your project? What results do you expect out of it? Thank you very much. 
the answer is following. I believe there are two sociological studies. The first one is a political one, and the second one is an analytical one. So a political one means that there is an idea about changing the world. It's proven. The benefits are shown. And the second one is an analytical one. It doesn't do anything uh, good for the world. It's just interesting to read. And it increases reflection. So I would like these two sides to join at some point. And in the future, I will try to to involve more actors into the study because now there is only a patient and the doctor. Uh, but it's evident that they do not communicate on their own. Uh, they have their own backgrounds. And um, the influence is uh, made by organizations. So I'd like to include them. So we have to include as many actors as possible and to study that. And for positive externality in the form of social policy with regards to doctors and patients, so they will have to be developed. Another question, if possible. My second question is to Gabriel and Daniel. Thank you for the experience you're talking about, including that level of uh, uh, studies and uh, histories. Uh, the question is, maybe you know some cases from history. I, what served as driver or a trigger so that the West uh, the, uh, well, Europe would start uh, uh, studying interaction between doctor and patient. What has to, what had to stimulate to trigger that story so that it would develop brighter and faster. It would enter a new level of discussion. We wish uh, it were in Russia. I hope you understood my question. Well, sorry, I didn't understand really good your question. Uh, uh, are you asking about uh, who, what can we do to foster this process? Uh, I'm not talking about you, but what sort of example maybe you could give us basing on the experience of your countries, including you maybe. You as scientific communicator, uh, of course you uh, influence that information. Uh, one of the reasons that changed uh, the relationship between patients and, uh, and doctors in, in Europe uh, is the fact that uh, laws actually introduced informed consent in a very strict way. And uh, I studied medicine in the 90s and the, the, we were uh, teach that uh, we, we had to shift from paternalistic to uh, a more uh, communicative way of interacting with patients because the law gave in the hand of the patients the power first of all to decide and second to uh, bring us in court if we behave in the wrong way. So actually uh, I, I don't think this is a good example on how you can foster your society and you probably want be happy with this but actually it's what happened on one side on the other side there was a cultural evolution of medicine that came from the United Kingdom mainly they started with the groups of doctors uh, that were used to discuss among them and with patients how they were treating patients and and how important patients were uh, for their own practice I was in ASCO the main oncological uh, uh, congress in the world in Chicago a few weeks ago and the topic was uh, learning from patients caring from patients, learning from patients. And the main topic was how important it is for us to listen to the patients, to give them a better treatment. Because if the, we don't listen to the patient, we don't know how the new treatments behave, if they have uh, side effects. So actually what's happening is that patients are more and more included even in the designing of research projects 
on treatment on cancer. And this is a, an, evol an evolution that took almost 30 years. I'm, I was, I, I'm 51 and I, as I entered in the medical school when I was 19. So 30 years passed by. Uh, and we had these two uh, cultural and legal evolution that brought us uh, to the situation we, we have now. You know, I, I think this is a real important problem and of course we do not have solutions on this. Let me make a couple of examples just to make the, you know, the, com the critical component coming out. As a neurologist, I'm directing a center in a big hospital, one of the largest hospitals in Italy, which is the Niguarda Hospital, and I'm directing a neuropsychological center, so I'm taking care of patients in general with problem with ease awareness, level of awareness awareness of disease. Let's make a very common example of a disease which is dramatic from this point of view, Alzheimer's disease, and in general the other kinds of dementia. This is a big problem because, for example, looking at the pharmacological trials, we do not have many examples of pharmacological trials because we have not cues at the moment, okay? So this is the main problem. But we have a couple of them, okay? For example, the ABBVIE uh, study, which is a multinational study. And the problem is informed consent. Who are you asking? Because of course, this trial provides a therapy for uh, the very beginning of the disease. But from the neuroscientific point of view, looking at the level of the awareness of the disease, this is not a problem only of very uh, severe Alzheimer patients. This is a problem also for mild cognitive impairment. So this is the first problem. And then the second problem, let me make the example of people with uh, low consciousness disease, okay, coma. We have a problem in Italy because you need the consent and you can't get the consent from those patients. And believe me, we have a numbers of study which are you know, not going on because we are not able to keep this consent and this is a problem, okay? So um, uh, solutions, of course, we have not solution. One possible not solution, but you know, one, one uh, trajectory is to work on research. We know a lot about, you know, uh, we are starting to know a lot about the level of uh, awareness uh, in different patients, also with patients without direct problem in the brain. Okay, we have examples uh, in patients with on different oncological diseases, uh, and we have to take care of this. And this is part of the new model of communication with these patients. And then the other problem is responsibility. We have to work on this. Because of course, as we have the informed consent, uh, the level of responsibility of doctors is lower and lower and lower. Because you would like to share responsibility, you don't want to take too much responsibility because the law is there and you, in a way, they are starting to be afraid. So I, 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 the real problem is the ethical component. And the ethical component means to involve the different parts and also caregivers. Don't forget this, because of course caregivers has an important role, although not well defined by law, but I think that in the therapeutic process we have to involve also them. More questions, thank you very much. Paulina, could you give the mic? Uh, my name is Senia. Good afternoon. My question is, uh, as a representative of the third party that Sergei was talking about, I'm working in Konstantin Khabiewski Charity Fund, and we regularly come across the things that we're discussing. Uh, the question is rather to Sergei and Andrei, if Gabriela and Daniela have some useful experience that you could apply here in our Russian reality, that could be also great. In your opinion, as patients, organizations, and charity funds, how, Andre, how could they help you, Andre, in solving this issue? And Sergey, you might, uh, probably, you might have some useful experience in this respect. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, it's a good question and a very timely question. I will explain you why, because uh, you ask a question about communication courses. I know that they will soon appear within the programs and uh, uh, 
it's not just enough that they will have to be in the programs of learning. It's important who will conduct these courses, how, what sort of professionals will be in charge. We can formally create whatever in paper. Uh, there will be a, a tick box approach. But uh, in order to improve the uh, situation, how these funds and NGO can have their um, influence, this is the experience that my uh, young fund uh, is already having in place and fund of uh, uh, prevention of cancer. So that is sponsoring professional communication courses, recruitment of doctors. Uh, we are specializing in oncological courses. These are communication skills with oncological patients having their specifics. And uh, to recruit a group to pay and to teach a group of doctors, then uh, create several steps uh, of the process. I think this is what an NGOs could deal with, and uh, uh, it's one, it would be wonderful, and we really miss that. Uh, if there are any ideas and thoughts, you could uh, come, well, come here. We could exchange our addresses, and I would like to chill with what speakers and uh, uh, coaches we've been working, who are professionals. And if you, if you need this information, I will be happy to share. It's not a secret. Thank you. And uh, we could, uh, as patients, uh, uh, another important thing. It's important to maintain balance because I often have to talk with the representatives of patients, communities, uh, uh, a lot of negative things uh, towards uh, doctors comes from patients' communities. Sometimes it's patients' extremism, extremism as a doctor and being an object for such extremism. I've been uh, several times in such uncomfortable situations, and I think they must have certain professionalism, and they must understand that uh, uh, you cannot talk with the doctors uh, using that, uh, uh, well, mm, aggressive uh, attitude. Once I was talking with that patient's communities, and uh, I had to oh, well talk to them that they um, uh, didn't have to use that aggressive uh, uh, approach. Uh, uh, so it was, there was no way to be. Uh, and when doctors have that communication skills and patients' communities have uh, uh, so-called understanding where uh, they can participate, it's important. Dialogue has to take place. Uh, uh, we, are, we are striving at maintaining good dialogue. It, well, I fully agree with it, but it's important to add uh, next points. Of course, NGOs and patients, uh, organizations, Maybe it will sound strange, but they must be under certain control of people who understand uh, the point. And in this case, of course, I'm fully aware of the fact that uh, uh, the experience of communication with the field is much uh, smaller than that of yours. I am using this sociological language. Or terminology, but from the standpoint of European experience, I am standing on the shoulders of the giants, learning everything by uh, uh, through the eyes of the others. In case of patients, organizations, and what they are doing in Europe, uh, what is taking place in Benelux and Belgium, uh, where the programs of joint medical philosophy and practical medicine are taught together in Russia, it's strange because uh, there is mismatch in our view. But in Europe, this is quite a viable form of education. And if you look at the programs of their courses, the way how they're working with patients organizations, uh, this form of communication, uh, and I'll probably come back to my experience the idea is that they are working with para scientific theorists, and unlike theory, they focus on the word theory, but not the word para. So they don't stigmatize uh, patients' uh, ideas, but they try to work with them. They don't uh, uh, give that uh, doubt, but they try to focus on what is the best uh, and optimum. That's why here I can tell you what people uh, 
uh, who are published in uh, medical sociological journals, but I think it's a very important experience that has to be derived. No more? Uh, uh, thing to say because I worked a lot with the patients' associations, in, especially in Italy, in the field of oncology. Uh, what you can really do is to uh, empower your members. And empowering means that you can provide them all the information that are not available in your country. You can uh, lobby for patients at uh, institutional level to give them more represent represent to be them more represented in in the decisions of how uh, the system should work with patients. I think this is quite important, and you should also be supportive, but with the choices when they have. Uh, uh, when they go to pseudoscience, but providing them the right information. I have my own experience. When I was 19, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, uh, and I wasn't happy at all. And I was a medical student, but as the only options I had were very uh, heavy uh, treatments like cortisone, actually, as a medical doc uh, student, and I didn't believe in it, but I went to an homeopath because I was so, 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 actually, you see that that you can be totally rational and and the, the mo at the moment I crossed the the door of the doctor I knew it was an irrational decision but I said I will try I'm so desperate I'm so young I don't want such a disease for all my life I mean it was something new and then I met the patients associations and many of them told me ah oh, I passed through this, I did the same, don't worry, and then you will go back to your treatments and you will see everything will be fine. And this peer-to-peer -peer communication was such important for me, so important for me. So this is my suggestion, empower your patient, give information and be empathic and lobby, lobby a lot to f <laughs> for them. Thank you. More questions we have? So we actually, uh, well, actually uh, exhausting our time, but if you allow me, I will share my personal experience. Uh, my name is Elena Dmitrieva. 20 years ago, when I was 33, so I was uh, diagnosed with cancer in gynecology. What did I come across? I really enjoyed all your presentations. I fully agree with all the standpoints, all things you've been talking about are just really important. My personal experience is also something that I would like to talk about. What did I come across? That was uh, not a pathology, it was just an ailment, probably. Uh, but everything, uh, my body was aching. Each cell of my body was uh, aching. Uh, there was so much pain. And um, so my life suddenly uh, quite different quality. I went to the doctors, to all the doctors, and uh, it lasted uh, for quite a long time, a day, another day, a week, it was unbearable. I had to go to work because uh, there was no final diagnosis. They, uh, there wasn't any final diagnosis. I went to extra sense. Uh, maybe the disease was not so severe, but actually I'm still alive 20 years after I'm here. And uh, that terrible pain that I felt, so it, uh, it was mitigated, so it was gone. I was not interested how I would be treated. I was interested just in the quality of my life, because that condition uh, that was at that time was absolutely unbearable. So what would I like to say here? If you remember, in Soviet times, each 
polyclinic, starting from pediatric polyclinic, had some uh, billboards uh, promoting healthy way of life in the walls. Uh, so since early years, we were prepared what to do, how to behave. I think that there is a rationale here. If a person who is far away from medicine and he comes across uh, some severe disease and uh, diagnosis, which is not confirmed, especially when it's not yet confirmed. Uh, uh, so he feels fear at young age. It's uh, so you, you don't accept that. And uh, if, for example, it were written, if you come across this thing, what should be the steps? For step number one, step number two, just believe me, of course, no one is reading that, some, uh, taking seriously, but still uh, it stays in your head. And going, uh, visiting a therapist or another doctor, you will still be reading them. So this is a very informative field that will allow to a patient who is not, uh, he is far away from medicine, so it will help to make the right decision in favor of official professional medicine. And second point, if you allow me, I would like to say that uh, sociology in this sense, um, um, is in such condition that uh, all these political points are given, but as to analytical statistics, uh, true analytical statistics, open statistics would be a better factor that would be in favor of official medicine. Well, common people just hear, well, our neighbor has gone ill and he was not, uh, he didn't recover, didn't manage to treat him, and it often results in the situation that people would not go to professional doctors. Will allow me to comment. Uh, I'm happy uh, that you are here. I'm glad that the uh, diagnosis that you had, uh, um, uh, that uh, it's not um, active anymore. So not to make uh, so painful the, this uh, situation, the state of the patient from uh, the from taking the test to the diagnosis, and after the diagnosis, we know that uh, it's uh, uh, hard to live with such such information. So there should be some psychological support in every oncological uh, center. There should be an oncopsychologist because everyone uh, reacts in a different way. Uh, people. Uh, feel pain in every cell, but some people start to listen to themselves for more, and um, psychologists can help in this situation. And if uh, the psychologist follows you up from the very day of uh, stating the diagnosis up to today, then you would feel much better. And I felt the same uh, because I needed uh, onco-psychological support. And um, uh, I didn't recognize this for a long time, and I'm still attending my onco-psychologist. It's really helpful. So thank you for your comment. But onco-psychological uh, support is nowadays one of the major issues. Thank you very much, Andrei. And I would like to ask you, um, each of you, one question, because in the end, I would like to uh, find and to get some definite response. So what is better to work on the mass communication level or on the level of uh, patient doctor face to face communication? So I would like to listen to each of the speakers. I'll begin then. Actually, all uh, the parts of the chain are very important, and every specialist, as a doctor, I, as a representative of a charity organization, I will do everything to improve communication between the doctor and the patient. I think that uh, it can be done. So you, as a scientific communicator, Lisa, could work in the sphere of mass information, mass information field, and do and make um, available 
information on um, uh, traditional uh, ways of treatments. There are plenty of films that show um, the show the way of the uh, treating of a patient, where they give open interviews. There are all types of treatments. It's, everything is discussed online. It's available. And if here in Russia, scientific communicators together with journalists could create a project that could talk about positive uh, sides of standard treatments, uh, then it, it will be very relevant, it will be very timely. And um, if a patient could uh, see such videos online uh, and he could see that um, such treatment can actually help and cure them, it would be very useful. So every part of the chain are very important and we need to try to improve the situation from different sides. That's my opinion. I agree that you have to work on both. Uh, as I told you, the relationship between science and society is an ecosystem where there are different stakeholders and different actors. And all the models we have to make it work uh, actually uh, refer on the empowerment of each stakeholder, each actor in, in the system of science communication. In my view, what's important is Maybe because uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, I, it's my first time in Russia and I'm discovering a totally different environment, of course, like any time I travel abroad from my country. But uh, what we experienced in Europe, and I really don't know if it's the same for Russia, because uh, the relationship between science and society is very culturally driven. There is no one model fits all. But what we experience is that communicating only what is positive is not good for the trust of uh, patients. It's not good for the trust in science. It's not good for the trust in doctors and in communication. You have to be as transparent as you can on what is positive and what is negative. You have to prepare your audience to the gray sides of science and of medicine. Unfortunately, we are unable as doctors to cure everybody. We are unable to give treatments that have no side effects. This is what pseudoscience is offering to our patients, something that is a final resolution of their disease with no side effects. And, and when they compare this with what we offer, if we say what we are offering you is a solution and then side effects compare, uh, appears, uh, they, they compare the two things and they say, okay, I can't trust my doctor because he didn't really explain me what was going on. So on my, on, from my point of view, it's really important to be as transparent as possible in, at each level, from the doctors to the media to the mass communication to the pharmaceutical industry and whatever. So, of course, the answer is both at the you know mass um, uh, level and the face to face. Um, I think that one important thing coming back to the association and also the presence of patients, thank you for your uh, witnesses, uh, is uh, uh, that um, both caregiver, association and patient should be involved in the, the guideline preparation, which is a problem in a way because interdisciplinarity is very difficult because we need more time. And then the other point, the face-to-face -face communication, we have a recent, we have had a recent uh, um, transformation in law in Italy, which concern uh, the uh, final life, uh, the end life decisions. Uh, and I think it's very interesting because this is a very uh, simple law and uh, uh, I think that everybody can understand, uh, um, you know, this law uh, and it, it, I think it really change uh, it really changes something in uh, in the Italian healthcare and don't forget because you know the face to face communication is very important don't forget that there are a lot uh, th there is a lot of differences uh, between individual and individual for example don't forget that we have also patients who don't like to know the truth and they make responsible their caregivers. And we have to respect this, which is a kind of a conflict uh, looking at our deontological duties. 
And as a neuroscientist, I am very, very interested in this. And I have to respect also these decisions. And for example, I think that the law in Italy is extremely advanced in this case because it takes care also of this. And we should not forget this, which means that the, the model we uh, have to face with uh, should be even more uh, complex, also involving caregivers. So it's, it's difficult, but we have to think about this. I think that the answer to the question, the question should be transformed a little bit because uh, every question has an answer uh, in it. So, in my opinion, it's not correct to divide patient and doctor. That's what I wanted to tell you and the society that they exist in. I agree with the, uh, with the point about sociology that has been mentioned before. There is uh, one problem, statistical data are much worse than you can um, think, because they do not show the whole palette uh, they don't show all the opinions that exist, but to lay the basis for uh, the question, I would like to resort to statistical data, Emmanuel uh, Institute, and I think that uh, many know about it. Um, they conducted a study where the second reason why patients go to alternative uh, medicine is uh, untrust towards the doctor. And the fifth reason is personal uh, statement uh, that are shared by friends and family. So if it's in the height, in the top of all of the most frequent answers, how can we uh, divide scientific communication and the uh, uh, work of the doctor and the patient? So I believe that the main reason why we are here is uh, to prove that we are as metro builders. We uh, dig from different points, but we get to, to the middle. And every colleague who gave a presentation today about constructing doctor-patient relationship inside the patient room or about uh, scientific um, science fiction uh, journals, not in a negative way, but uh, some patient organizations, they all contribute uh, as deep waters that are often not seen. They all are very important parts that coexist and they make a form, a unite form. And if we, you take out one part, so you you will see the changes in the whole. So the relationship is proportional. The the direction of the relationship is different. <laughs> 